Okay, let's uh, get started again here. Um, sodium has a pretty low ionization energy, so um, chlorine can pretty much take that electron. But what if um, what if chlorine tried to take something that is the electron from something that has a, a higher ionization energy, something that's harder to ionize? So let's take a look at that. And so a species that has a higher ionization energy would be like chlorine. So let's do chlorine versus chlorine. Each chlorine wants to take an electron from the other. So let's take a look at this one. If this chlorine tries to strip this electron off this other chlorine, will it be successful? It actually, it won't. And, and the same thing here, they won't be successful. In fact, um, what will result is a tie, basically. And in the tie, um, what's gonna happen is both chlorines are gonna be pulling on the electron, but neither is going to win. Um, but they don't come out losers either. This is called a win-win situation. A win-win situation is, you know, they don't win outright, but what they're going to end up doing is sharing the electrons. So if they share these two electrons, we'll create something called a covalent bond. We're gonna share the electrons. Okay, when we share the electrons, um, we can still end up with an octet, but we have to double count the electrons. So for example, we want that octet because we can fill the outer shell. So if we look at this coin, this coin has an octet that is eight electrons around it, just like what we saw in sodium chloride. However, these ones don't belong entirely to that. So that, those have to be shared with the other chlorine. And when we look at the other chlorine, the other chlorine is going to be happy because it also has an octet. It'd be happier if those electrons belong solely to it, but in this case, the best compromise is to share. When we show covalent bonds, we usually show them with a line like this. When we show ionic bonds, we don't show anything. We just show the ions adjacent to one another. But covalent bonds are going to be shown by a line. Now, what this line represents is that shared pair of electrons here. And so this is the covalent bond being shown here. Hydrogen. Hydrogen is weird because hydrogen can lose like an alkali metal or can gain like a halogen. So, so hydrogen will try to take electrons if it can. If it takes electrons, it can fill the first shell. It only takes two electrons to fill the first shell. And so here, this hydrogen is going to try to strip an electron. This hydrogen is going to strip an electron. But what's going to result is a tie. In other words, what's going to result is a sharing scenario here. And so we can form a covalent bond. So hydrogen forms diatomic molecules just like chlorine. Um, chlorine wants the octet. Hydrogen wants something called a duet because it only takes two electrons to complete the first shell. So it's happy with just two. Chlorine needs eight to fill up this, this shell. All right, this forms uh, discrete molecules. And so we get molecular compounds this way. We have sharing. Let me skip this. Let's skip this. When we look at hydrogen. Um, what's happening with hydrogen is this: we have an electron. Let's look at all these dots represented here. The blue dots. Possible location of the electron. Yeah. This this the blue dots are representing the orbital, and yeah, possible location. So greater probability closer. Well, here's the electron this orbital. Yeah. So it could be here, it could be there. Most likely it's close by. This is another orbital. And so when we bring these two hydrogens together, what we do is we overlap the orbitals. When we overlap the orbitals, there's going to be a greater density of dots in the overlap region. You know, there's going to be twice the density of dots in the overlap region. So we take this blue cloud and 
bring in this blue pound and then double the blue cloud here. It's called the internuclear region. Outside the nuclei, the dots are kind of slim, but in the internet. So there's a good probability that the electrons are here. This is what holds the covalent bond together. What holds the covalent bond together are the two nuclei are attracted to the negative, we call this a negative charge cloud, or negative charge density of the electron cloud here. This electron cloud is negative. And so the two nuclei are held together by this negative cloud here. Does that make sense? And so this is how a covalent bond works. The two nuclei here are going to be um, attracted to the negative cloud here, overlapping orbitals. Here's fluorine, like chlorine. It's going to form covalent bonds. It's going to be tied. This is what we call. We have uh, different uh, terminologies that we use for this. These are called bonding pairs. These are called lone pairs. So we have lone pairs and bonding pairs. We look at hydrogen, there are no lone pairs on hydrogen, only a bonding pair. We look at fluorine, fluorine has three lone pairs and one bonding pair on each. Three lone pairs and one bonding pair. The bonding pair is shared between the two fluorines. The lone pair and bonding pairs. We have the octet rule. Octet rule is eight. Eight electrons surrounding. So this fluorine has not had two, four, six, eight. This fluorine has not had two, four, six, eight. Count these as the lines two, two, four, six, eight. Octet rule. Octet rule is important because that's corresponds to the filled shell. That's what we want. Now we're getting into polar and nonpolar. Um, it depends here. It depends on chlorine. It depends on the opponent. You know, chlorine's going to try to strip electrons. Way. So we're going to have different scenarios that result in pair. So if we look at sodium chloride, the ionization energy for sodium is not very high, pretty low, so chlorine can easily take that electron. If chlorine takes that electron, then pretty much it doesn't have to share. You know, that electron now belongs to chlorine. So we'll draw the electron cloud like this, representing that. There are going to be electron clouds over here, but we'll just show it like this for right now. However, for hydrogen, um, hydrogen is a lot harder to ionize than sodium. A lot harder. And so if chlorine tries to pluck the um, electron off hydrogen, it's going to have a a lot more trouble um, pulling that electron off hydrogen. In fact, hydrogen wants to take an electron. So hydrogen has one valence electron, and then chlorine's going to come over and try to take it. Chlorine, of course, is a better oxidizer than hydrogen is. So chlorine's going to try to take it, but hydrogen's not going to let go. Sodium let go of it completely. So sodium was completely ionized, but hydrogen doesn't let go completely. And so what results is a sharing of the electron. But in this case, it's uneven sharing. Chlorine versus chlorine is even sharing, because each are equivalent in terms of oxidizing ability. So chlorine versus chlorine, we have what we call a nonpolar bond. A nonpolar um, covalent bond. Sorry, nonpolar covalent bond. A nonpolar covalent bond means it's shared evenly. If it's shared evenly, and I look at the electron cloud, the electron cloud looks very symmetric. This. It's evenly distributed between the two chlorines. However, something like this, hydrogen versus chlorine. Which one do you think is a more powerful oxidizer, hydrogen or chlorine? Chlorine. Since chlorine is more powerful, chlorine pulls the electron closer to it most of the time. But hydrogen doesn't completely let go. So there's a small probability that the electron will be next to hydrogen, but a much greater probability the electron will be next to chlorine. However, it wasn't strong enough to completely ionize it. 
And so these are the three scenarios we're going to get um, so far here. Since it didn't strip it completely, there's still some sharing. It's uneven sharing. So we're going to call this a polar covalent bond. This is a non-polar covalent bond. And so these are the um, arrows here. Here, completely. Here, partially. And here, just evenly. So we look at the electron cloud. Here it's evenly distributed. Here it's asymmetrically distributed. That is biased towards chlorine. Here chlorine completely takes it. And so uh, this is ionic. This is polar covalent. This is covalent. Now, um, this is increasing polarity. Turns out that ionic are the most polar bonds. Polar means like a north pole, south pole. In this case, it means a negative pole and a positive pole. You know, and so uh, the most polar would be ionic. And so we need a, an idea. You know, this is like a tug of war for electrons. Here's an even tug of war. Here's a, a, a tug of war where chlorine's stronger. Here's a, a tug of war where chlorine's much, much stronger. So it easily wins. And so we need uh, some, so this is what it's showing here. This is non-polar covalent even sharing. This is a polar covalent unequal sharing. And this is ionic completely unequal sharing. And in fact, no sharing because X takes all of it. And so we need some kind of gauge for the strength. Well, one gauge is maybe the oxidizing ability, but hydrogen doesn't even appear on the oxidizing side of the chart. And so what we're going to use as a, a gauge for strength in this tug of war for electrons is something called electronegativity. Electronegativity is defined as the ability of an atom of that element in a molecular molecule to attract bonding electrons pairs to itself. In other words, it's the ability to attract electrons. That's it. Ability to attract electrons. Fluorine has the greatest ability. Fluorine has the highest electronegativity, and so it's the strongest attraction for electrons. And its ranking is 4.0. So 4.0 is the highest. What's the worst? Fluorine's the best. The worst is francium. Actually, the noble gases are bad too. Noble gases are very bad because they don't want any extra electrons. So no, but we're going to ignore the noble gases. Francium is the worst. So if there's a tug of war before, between fluorine and francium, it's totally one, one sided. You know, fluorine's can completely dominate francium. And so let's uh, compare the uh, electronegativities. Let's look at chlorine versus chlorine. What is chlorine? Chlorine's a 3.2 in strength. So if I look at the bottom one, that's a 3.2 versus a 3.2. They're both strong, and they're both equally strong. So this is going to be a, a tie. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get a gauge by, of this by looking at the difference in electronegativity. Difference in electronegativity. The difference in electronegativity, 3.2 minus 3.2 is zero. There's no difference in electronegativity. It's a tie. They're the same strength. Okay, let's look at sodium versus chlorine. If we look at sodium, sodium is a 0.9, chlorine is a 3.2. So what's the difference? The difference is 2.3. 2.3 is a significant difference. A significant difference, so much so that one takes all the electrons. It's a winner take all scenario. And so the difference is 2.3. However, for what about hydrogen and chlorine? Well, hydrogen is in a weird position. Hydrogen is midway between. And so hydrogen is between boron and carbon. In fact, hydrogen has electronegativity very similar to boron and carbon's electronegativity. So hydrogen is a 2.2, chlorine is a 3.2. And so the difference in electronegativity is a 1.0. And so we end up with a polar covalent bond. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with some crude border lines. You know, at what point does it go from covalent to polar covalent? At what point um, is kind of arbitrary, but it's set. It's going to be non-polar covalent. 
if the electronegativity difference is is a covalent nonpolar. Um, if the electronegativity difference is less than, let's say, 0.5, if the difference is less than 0.5, then we're going to call it nonpolar covalent. So, for example, carbon and hydrogen. Carbon is 2.6, hydrogen is 2.2. So, um, if I have carbon and hydrogen bonded, then they're pretty evenly matched. You know, again, this is 2.6, this is 2.2. The, they're pretty evenly matched, so much so that the difference here is 0.4. The difference is so small, 0.4, that we're going to just pretty much call it nonpolar. You know, it's pretty much a tie. It's not a, a perfect tie, but it's close enough to a tie. And so, if we have a, a difference in electronegativity of 0.5 or less, then it, it's going to be pretty much a tie. Zero, it's a, obviously, it's going to be a tie. Then. Um, Let's say from about 0.5 to about 1.5, if we have an electronegativity difference of about 0.5 to 1.5, we're going to call it polar covalent. And if the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.5, then we're getting to ionic. You know, one side is going to dominate the other. These again, these are rough cutoffs. The book doesn't even use these. Yeah. Give you any criteria. But let's look at HO. If I have an HO bond, what would I classify that as? Well, hydrogen is 2.2, oxygen is 3.4. This is wrong. This is wrong. This is an error here. Oxygen is 3.4, hydrogen is 2.2. So 3.4 minus 2.2 gives us 1.2. This is right. So 1.2 difference means what type of bond is that? Polar covalent. So hydrogen and oxygen bond should be polar covalent. Well, what about a hydrogen carbon bond? Well, it's the 2.6 and the 2.2, the difference is 0.4, which is non-polar covalent or just covalent. And so um, this one's more polar. The bigger the difference, the more polar it is. Ion is the most polar. Sometimes we have to form more than one bond. We'll talk about that. Like in oxygen and, and, and hydrogen. Yeah, oxygen, oxygen wants how many? Oxygen has two, four, six, six valence electrons. So it wants eight. So it wants two more. But hydrogen doesn't have two to give. And so what has to happen with this is it has to take one from this hydrogen. Can it take it completely? No. It doesn't take it completely. The electronegativity difference isn't big enough, but it does form a polar covalent bond. So there's sharing there, but it's unequal sharing. And it's got to take one from this hydrogen, and to fill its octet, it's got to take another from the other hydrogen. So that means the octet rule is satisfied. If I look at how many electrons around oxygen, I count two, four, six, eight. Hydrogen only needs a duet, so two, two, because the first shell only needs two. And so that's water. Nitrogen needs three, so in this case it forms three, what we call single bonds here, uh, to complete its octet. And so it's got to share. The electronegativity difference between nitrogen and hydrogen uh, is, would be classified as polar covalent, and so it's not ionic there. Sometimes we form these things called double bonds. And these are some other unusual species. We're, we're going to talk about these species when we do the Lewis structure. So I'm going to skip this slide for right now. And I'm going to skip this slide for right now. And we'll talk about metallic bonds next. So we talked about ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and now we're going to talk about metallic bonds. Metallic bonds, um, the way we visualize metals is like this. Next slide here. Uh, we visualize metals as being fixed Our book says metal cations, which is fine. Like, say this is sodium. We'd have fixed sodium ions. And then the valence electrons are free. 
are mobile. And so one way to visualize this are the metal cations of pylons up here and the electrons of the ocean. And so this is why they call it the electron C model. And so the pier pylons, or pilings or whatever they call them, are fixed and then the water is free to live anywhere. So this would be like sodium, this would be like magnesium metal. Magnesium metal is neutral. The valence electrons there can cancel off the positive charge. And sodium metal is neutral as well. But that's one way to visualize the metal is the electron C model of metal. But we can form alloys. Alloys are mixtures of metals. Um, for example, like here, we'll take the potass uh, sodium out and put a potassium in there. So we can get a sodium potassium mix, which we call an alloy. So metals can be alloyed mix. Let's take a look at some alloys here, like 18 karat gold. 18 karat gold is not pure, it's 75% gold, 12.5% silver, and 12.5% copper. So we just substitute some of the gold atoms for silver and copper. Brass is mostly copper and some zinc. Bronze is copper and tin. Carbon steel is iron and carbon. Pewter is tin, antimony, and copper. Stainless steel is iron with some chromium, nickel. Sterling silver is silver and copper. There are many different alloys, you know, including stainless steel. There are hundreds of alloys of stainless steel. Okay, chapter 13 is a continuation of chapter 12. So chapter 13 continues with bonds here, and that gets into things a little deeper. And so let's take a look at um, multiple bonds next. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at CO2 next here. CO2 is carbon. Carbon has how many valence electrons? Carbon has six electrons. six electrons total. Four. It's actually 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. How many valence electrons? Four. Four. Two of these are core. The rest are valence. We put them like this. It's four valence electrons. So it wants an octet or it wants to lose. So it either wants to gain four or lose four. So plus four to minus four would be its charge. Oxidation state. Well, oxygen comes along. And so carbon, of course, will try to take electrons from oxygen. But oxygen will try to take electrons from carbon. Who's, who's stronger, oxygen or carbon? Well, um, if we go back to the electronegativity, electronegativity tells us the strength of these types of things. So let's take a look at the electronegativity chart. Electronegativity chart pretty much follows the size chart. stronger? Oxygen. Is oxygen strong enough to strip the electrons off carbon completely? No. No, because what is the difference here? It's 40. Yeah, if we look at the difference, um, it's 0 0.8. 0 0.8 means it's going to be what type of bond? Polar covalent. Polar covalent. It's going to be a polar covalent bond, so they're going to share, but it's going to be unequal sharing. And so basically, oxygen wants to take two electrons this one and let's take this one here. And so if oxygen takes two electrons, um, what's going to happen is we're going to end up sharing four like this. This is called a double bond. And this double bond is polar covalent. 
polar covalent because of its difference in electron negativity, double bond because it's sharing two pairs of electrons rather than just one pair of electrons. But that leaves two electrons left on carbon here. So what we're going to need is we're going to need a second oxygen to come along here. And the second oxygen is going to try to strip the electrons off carbon, but it, it can't get them completely. And so we end up with a structure like this. This is the, uh, what we call the Lewis structure for the CO2 molecule. This forms a discrete molecule. One of the things we look for always in Lewis structures are um, the octets. We look for octets. And so if I look at CO2, let's look at this oxygen over here. If I look at this oxygen on the left, it has an octet. Eight electrons, two, four, six, eight. And then I look at this carbon. This carbon also has an octet. I just have to double count these ones here, but there's two, four, six, eight. And it's okay to double count because they're sharing. And then I look at this one, I'll be unevenly, but they're still sharing. This oxygen, that has an octet. And so this looks like a good structure because everybody has an octet. And so everybody has that filled shell uh, configuration. So this is a Lewis structure for CO2, where we have to do um, multiple bonds. How about um, nitrogen? Can you draw the Lewis structure for nitrogen for me, N2? Tell me what kind of bond 